else were you gonna kill? He said five at a time, like gas stations. When law enforcement arrested the Bever brothers, Robert and Michael, in 2015, they were soaked in red. One of them seemed regretful, while the other one was proud of his actions. He said he would have taken more lives if the law hadn't caught up with him. But one of the brothers was lying. A few months in jail would reveal the horrible truth. Why did five members of the Bever family lose their lives to Robert and Michael? What were they planning to do afterward? And could it have all been prevented? Let's explore the full story of Robert and Michael Bever. It was just before midnight on July 22nd, 2015, in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, when the emergency services received a call. It was a young or teenage girl, judging by the voice, and she was in pain. Broken Arrow 911. Hello? Hello? Oh. My brother's attacking my family. Crystal Bever couldn't say any more on the phone. Not because she was afraid of her brothers, but because she had been injured in the arms, chest, and neck. When the paramedics arrived at the house minutes later, she was crawling on the driveway, using her last strength to get away from a real-life horror show. She was rushed into an ambulance and given emergency treatment. But before she passed out from the pain, Crystal made sure that the paramedics knew her brothers had done this. Around the same time, law enforcement arrived at the Bevers' home, only to hear gut-wrenching screams coming from inside the house. When they barged in, however, it was a minute too late. The Bever parents, April and David, were lying lifeless on the floor. Seven-year-old Christopher and his five-year-old sister, Victoria, were also dead inside the bathroom. Their slightly older brother, Daniel, was lying in a pool of blood inside his dad's office. When the officers saw a crib, their hearts skipped a beat. The hallway bathroom door was closed. It's locked. So Officer Walker, who had also joined with the search, kicks the door in. But at that time, we see two young children, also deceased, multiple uh, Shock. Nothing but shock. But to their surprise, they found a crying baby, unscathed, two-year-old Autumn. So Autumn had survived the massacre. And by nothing short of a miracle, Crystal pulled through too, though not without lifelong trauma and physical damage. This was one of the worst cases of familicide recorded in the United States. Why would two teenage brothers want to do such a stomach-turning thing? And where are they now? The authorities found the Bever brothers within a few hours. They were hiding behind a bush in a wooded area behind their house. They seemed to lack an escape plan. 17-year-old Robert Bever was covered in dirt and blood. His eyes were wild and manic, almost as if the spree wasn't over. His 16-year-old brother had a different face. He seemed remorseful, or at least sorry for himself for getting arrested. The officers didn't need any other proof. Crystal had told them what had happened, and the brothers were covered in their family's DNA and were hiding behind a bush. If that wasn't incriminating enough, Robert proudly confessed to unaliving his family. With the brothers in jail, the detectives would slowly uncover a terrifying story of loneliness, obsession, and pure evil. Broken Arrow is a pretty small town. In fact, it's hardly a town, but a suburb of Tulsa, Oklahoma. The suburb as a whole is home to just over 100,000 people, but the way the Bevers lived, it felt like they were in the middle of nowhere. The Bever family comprised of nine members, parents, April and David, and seven children. They lived in a big, beautiful house close to the Arkansas River at 709 Magnolia Court. This might have been heaven for the religious Bevers, who only wanted to live their lives between their home and their local church. But for the kids, it was a different story. You see, the Bevers were homeschooled, and as far as their parents were concerned, why would anyone need anything else apart from their loving family and a big gorgeous house? The Bevers weren't well-versed in child psychology. Children and teenagers need people their age, outside of their families, to develop crucial social skills. They need to learn to make friends, form relationships, and navigate the world outside of the home to develop into healthy, independent adults. Even getting in trouble is a natural part of being a teenager. You get to test your boundaries and claim your independence one silly thing at a time. But the Bever kids didn't do this. In fact, many of their neighbors remembered them as a really quiet family. You'd expect a family of nine to be especially loud, and perhaps to see seven kids running around the yard wreaking havoc. But David ruled with an iron fist, a traditional patriarch who behaved as though the house was his to rule. He'd married April 
back in 1987. He was 23 and she was 15. Yep, 15. She was from a family that thought nothing of giving away their teenage daughter to a fully grown man. Reportedly, he was just as controlling with April as he was with their kids. April soon took on the role of a happy stay-at-home mom. She was a big fan of Reddit, where she described herself as tired, happy, blessed. Any mother of seven would probably agree, at least with the first part. David worked as a technician for HP, and he was the only person earning money for the family. Meanwhile, April took to Reddit to ask for homeschooling advice and feel closer to her community. It wasn't long before Robert took to the internet to appease his loneliness too. He was the oldest Bever child in the house, and as he turned into a teenager, he despaired over his isolation. He had no friends his age and no means to visit them. So he decided to make online friends through a YouTube channel. Salute. Hey everyone, it's me Colt Empire. In case you didn't know, you found me by accident. Or you're expecting someone else. Yeah, why would you do that? Anyway, this is the second first ever update which I think is a major improvement. Props for props for that. Impossible. Yeah. Think I'm on something there. It was as comically cringy as a teen's YouTube channel can be, but Robert did gain a few followers along the way. New hairstyle, check it. It's called a fauxhawk, where I don't have to shave the rest of my head, but I still get a uh, mohawk. I hope it still looks like a fauxhawk. Never mind the content, Robert was happy, and it wasn't long before his little brother joined in on the venture. Well, Michael was Robert's little brother, but he was only one year younger. They were almost like twins. They did everything together, and Michael followed Robert almost blindly. And, like many teens, once they discovered the vast internet, there was no stopping them. It had become an obsession. They would spend hours and hours, well into the night, delving into the darkest corners of YouTube, anything they knew their parents didn't want them to see. Soon enough, they discovered the Columbine school sh It was a tragic story about two boys who let their worst sides take control of them. But to Robert and Michael Bever, these boys were legends. They were brave and cool, and they achieved eternal fame in death. Robert and Michael figured out that if they could take a dozen lives, they could easily do 50 plus. Robert declared they should become famous through murder. However, for the Columbine boys, it was too easy in Robert's eyes. They just had to turn up at their school and unalive everyone in sight. The Bever boys did not have a school. Their school was their home. So the only way they could commit a world famous massacre was to take out their entire family first. In 2014, the year before the Robert got his first job at a call center. His parents were proud of him, but they didn't know that his only motivation was to save money to buy weapons. Within a few months, his room became a war showroom. Knives, matches, Kevlar vests, black masks, and every dangerous object you can imagine. Here's the thing, April and David saw Robert's room. So why did this couple not jump at the sight of so many weapons? Reportedly, it was Crystal, who was a couple years Michael's junior, who sounded the alarm to her mother. She asked her if she'd seen the new objects in Robert's room and if she wasn't worried about it. April said something along the lines of, it's typical teenage boy stuff. Wait, what? How many teenage boys do you know who have machetes and Kevlar vests in their bedrooms? Even without Robert's internet history at hand, April could have asked herself more questions. But she never imagined her sons could harbor such dark intentions. Maybe she didn't want to believe it. I don't know about you guys, but I keep wondering about all the red flags that must have popped up in that house prior to the final day in July 2015. If his family didn't think much of the machete collection, who knows? how many cries for help Robert sent out before he went out and did his absolute worst. Not to put blame on the poor parents, but these things rarely happen overnight. Robert's interrogation was never released to the public. However, Michael's was, and it was clear from his statements that he felt more roped in by his brother than in control of his actions. Uh, a couple months ago, I think we got to this guy, this guy was done talking about uh, voodoo and rampage and stuff like that. So okay. I didn't take it seriously at first, but then he started buying like body armor and stuff. So he was buying weapons because mm -hmm. you guys had talked about murdering. Yeah, but then he started planning again. Okay. And then I went along with it because I didn't see the other way I thought I would want to do it. I very quickly learned tonight that I didn't. But that you didn't want to do it? I didn't want to do it. 
Michael claimed that he didn't take anyone's life that night. He just jagged his nine-year-old brother, Christopher. He claimed something else that would reveal his brother's motive. In their eyes, the Bever family just stood in the way of their bigger plan. You see, Robert had ordered a bunch of firearms and ammo to arrive at their home, and the delivery date was July 23rd. So they needed their whole family dead by then. How would they explain their delivery to their parents and their fearful siblings? The plan went as follows. Take out their entire family, turn them into little pieces, hide them inside various bins, hide the bins in the attic, then take the weapons and raise their kill count to at least 50. Why? Michael said this was Robert's ambition. He wanted to like eat, eat the kill like amount of other famous people like Colin Bond and uh, James Egan. In a word, fame. Robert wanted to be world famous, and to him, this was the easiest way possible. There was no conscience, no feeling bad for the lives taken, no regard for any life. I mean, who else were you gonna kill? Just whoever you ran into? Yeah. Hey, my dream, he said five at a time, like gas stations were missing ones. Okay, and then you just keep going. Yep, the brothers weren't planning to hit any school or place in particular. They were just going to rain hell on whoever they saw. Then they were going to die in a out and become world famous. Here's where it gets interesting. Until now, you would be excused to think Robert is pure evil and Michael was just the little brother transfixed by his controlling brother and following him blindly, whatever his plan. But Michael was lying. The detective suspected he might not be truthful. During a homicide interrogation, any suspect could try and pin the blame on another suspect. Many couples, brothers, and friends start turning on each other once they're separated. So wouldn't Michael try and make Robert look like the evil one if he could get away with a lesser punishment? Did you cut your finger? Is that your other hand? Is that? I think, I think I might have no, I think I might have done this. You know, this. How are you feeling? This whole thing, like feeling when you first step to get caught, I think you only last you about thirty minutes. I didn't want to do that. Yeah. The detective also asked Michael about his family, trying to find a source for their awful motive. Robert might have claimed he wanted to be world famous, but no one unalives their parents without some hatred for them. Yeah, I mean, mom's okay, but dad was older. Just a little bit too much. David's iron fist might have proved too much for Robert and Michael. Their hatred for him, built over years and years, might have triggered Robert's go-to motive. Here's where it gets even more tragic. Michael claimed he was more of an innocent tag-along, but as the detective asked him for more details, he revealed that he indeed was not being truthful. First, the two boys attacked Crystal after luring her to watch something on Robert's computer. Then, Robert carried on toward his parents, and Christopher and Victoria locked themselves inside the bathroom. That's when Michael started crying, as if Robert was striking him. He begged his younger siblings to let him inside the bathroom for protection. When they opened the door, he unalived Christopher and Robert slew Victoria. Then Michael did it again, when Daniel locked himself in his dad's office. I was like, let me in. The detective then made it clear he was just as responsible. But what I'm saying is, is it's not Robert's the one that should get all the credit here. I mean, for, I mean, um, yeah, well, because it's a big deal. I mean, you're going to be on the news. Um, you know what I mean? Michael said Robert was set out to commit a mass that he would have just taken his life too if he didn't tag along. But when Robert was interrogated, he said his little brother was just as eager as him to go on a spree and take out his family. In fact, it was Michael who ended his mother's life. Michael used a kitchen knife on his mother's throat as she was begging him to save her life and phone 911. And yet, he was acting remorseful, regretful, and pointed his finger at Robert. On July 23rd, 3,000 rounds of ammo arrived at the Bever house. It only added fuel to the fire as news around the country was sharing this shocking case. Broken Arrow PD and OSBI investigating. We know a family of nine lived here. The parents and three children are dead. Another child, a 13-year-old, is fighting to live, and the youngest family member, a two-year-old girl, is in the custody of the state and not hurt. Police say the two other children, teenage boys, were the ones responsible for these killings. And the details of what took place last night are slowly starting to be painted today a gruesome 
picture. The brothers were charged with five counts of first-degree murder and battery and were tried as adults. Throughout his trial, Robert seemed jolly. Was he enjoying the spotlight? However, the Bever brothers seemed to swap roles entirely within a matter of months. In 2016, Robert tried to take his own life in his prison cell. He initially pled not guilty, but after this incident, he changed his plea to guilty. Robert Bever was sentenced to five consecutive life terms without the possibility of parole. We have breaking team coverage this evening. One of the brothers accused of murdering his five family members in Broken Arrow will spend the rest of his life in prison. Michael, on the other hand, insisted he was innocent and refused to change his plea from not guilty. Robert even took to the stand for him, taking responsibility for the slayings. But he admitted Michael lured his siblings to their deaths and he took their mother's life. So Michael got an identical prison sentence. Both Bevers will die in prison. The tables had turned in the most disturbing way. While Robert is remorseful and on his way to rehabilitation, his little brother seems to be going down an even darker path. These drawings were found in his diary in prison. He doesn't seem responsive to therapy or coming to terms with what he did back in 2015. Robert, on the other hand, has taken to the media and spoken about his deep regrets. Once you've seen that evil people are just normal people too, then you realize how much of a challenge it is to be a good person and live a good, normal life and help people instead of killing them. If I could go back and kill myself before I had a chance to do that, I would. That's, that's how serious I am about it. In 2019, the Bever House burned down. It was arson, of course, but in such a condemned place, the authorities were willing to turn a blind eye to it. The place had become a creepy visiting spot for rebellious teens, and no one in the neighborhood was happy to even pass by it. Now, a park stands in its place, a sign of people trying to move on from a tragedy that will haunt Broken Arrow forever. Crystal and Autumn have been adopted by the same family. They have a chance to grow into happy adults and try to overcome their terrifying trauma together. But can you ever move on after an incident like this? Hey, thanks for watching. What are your thoughts on this shocking case? Let me know in a comment. And before you go, don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that bell button. See you next time.